Why do ancient entities of Africa hide in the stars? Can mass hysteria explain a crucial moment in UFO history? Did children really witness what they thought they did in 1994? Today we test the believability of the Rua incident. Welcome to Believing the Bizarre, where we dive into the unknown and the unusual and tell you whether or not we find it believable. Welcome in today. Gather around, Join folks. us. Join. Come to the story circle, children. Children. Yes. Everybody. Yeah, but it's about children. It is. It's about damn children. This is a pretty famous uh, sighting. I'm actually, I'm not surprised you haven't heard of it because it's like. Well, I've heard of it now. Now you've heard of it. It's like between well-known and like in like on the cusp. I feel like you know the alien stuff. You know the story. I I am curious if you let us know after you listen to this episode if you if you already had known about it or not. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting to see. Last podcast, we still haven't done Raw as well. <laughs> Just saying, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, it'll be like you put it like that. It'll be our ten year anniversary, and we'll do something like Bigfoot or Roswell. <laughs> Bigfoot. I don't know if we'll ever do specifically just Bigfoot. Yeah, just it's like off-brand, great value, Louisiana cousins. I would say I could see and like— I do mean Louisiana heartfeltly. Uh, oh, yeah. Because of the uh, Honey Island Swamp Monster. It could be like the Pacific Northwest Bigfoot. That could be an episode. The P&Ws? Yeah. So before we start today, our, some of our sources are the National Library of Medicine, Vice, and IFLS. I F L S. Yes, I fucking love science. Is the website dope? So this takes place in Africa, Zimbabwe. You might say you could say that. I think the city is Rua. I think that's why it's called the Rua incident. This is very rural where this takes place. So okay, this is in the country. I, I don't know anything about Zim- the only thing I know about Zimbabwe. The only reason I knew it existed as a child was in Metal Gear. When Snake is is fighting Gray Fox, who's like the ninja in that game. Yeah. They talk. No, that's a lie. I don't even think it's Zimbabwe. I think they, it was Zanzibar. Never mind. I don't know why I know Zimbabwe. Zanzibar is a tropical island, right? It's because I'm an adult now. That's why I, I know it exists. Oh, uh, yeah. Different Z. Um, Please, I, I have a connection to Zimbabwe, but I don't remember what it is either. <laughs> that's not that meaningful. It's, Were you there this? No. You, you're around the age of these children. I was, I was like two or yeah. four, three at the time. I was young. Oh, they were young, too. Yeah, they're in elementary school, though. Oh, but, they were gifted, too. So. <laughs> I, don't know if they were, I don't know if they were gifted, but they were gifted. <laughs> they were financially gifted. That's right. The children in the school and the country of Zimbabwe had their lives changed in 1994. Now, the aerial school was a normal elementary school in Rua, a rural area of the country in Africa that only had 62 students at the time. So that's the whole class. Was 62. The class or the school? The whole school. I'm, I apologize. The whole school only had 62 children. I was going to say, you're coming from like inner city Cleveland. So when you say only 62, <laughs> you know, my, <laughs> my classes are like 16. So for you, you oh, might have real? been. Yeah. Oh, in I, elementary school. I had so many. There were so many kids in my school. There were hundreds. Yeah. It was a madhouse. Wait, hundreds in one class? No. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> could you, could you no, no, the entire class would be roll call. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, all right, uh, what name starts? Zach, and then here, just ding, 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 ding. It's like, yeah. all right, class over. Yeah, no, I, I mean, there were probably like thirty-two in my in my third grade class. Okay, but like it the whole, st- yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm going on a tangent, but something happened here at this normal place in front of these children that may have been one of the most significant events in UFO history. That's a big claim, by the way. It is. Well, this is pretty pretty potent. The school year had really just started, and the children began getting into the boring routine of school life. Ah. But on September 16th, the students of the aerial school started to notice something out of the ordinary when they were on their morning break. They're all out in the play yard, the whole like fence and area around the school. And the children were playing outside when the teachers were inside there doing a faculty meeting. Wait, uh, there was no supervision? No, there was not. This was 1994. 
uh, I feel like that's a big part of this is because there was no supervision. Wow. They were um, out there trading stocks and talking about what <laughs> the next Audi they were going to buy. The teachers? No, no, the, the, the kids. <laughs> oh, teachers okay. probably weren't making that much. No, they didn't have Audi money. They have like – Fisher Price Audi. Yeah. Tonka. No, but you're right. The kids were like talking about you know financial dividends and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes. But that's when a few students noticed they saw a flat, shiny disc fly in from the sky in the sunlight and land on a very close hill. But that's when several children ran to the edge of the school property into the border. And from this distance, they could see that the disc was was very close. Maybe, maybe only like 20 feet. It was very close from the border of the school. And from this disc, they saw something emerge. They saw figures coming out of the craft, going onto the hill. The children said that they were only in the area for like 15 minutes. It was very quick. They came down, landed, came out. It was only 15 minutes. And they left as quickly as they'd come. So they landed, walked around, observed, got back in the ship and took right off. They told all the children, told the teachers about what they saw. They did not necessarily believe them. No. But that's not where it stopped. The children came home that night. And they all told their parents the same thing, the same story. And this, in turn, launched an investigation in the UFO community because the, the, the parents started talking to the press mm. about that their children saw aliens. I bet the press were so excited to have this news. I think so. There's not much. I don't think there's like much. Like you hear on. one parent say it and you're like, oh, that's weird. And then you start hearing more parents come out and say it. Yeah. Yeah. When we get to it later, that's one of the. One of the things that makes this so compelling. It's it like, the, imagine the aliens coming down and they're like, ah, this is Earth. Let's see what it's like. And they're like, oh my God, they keep their children in cages. <laughs> <laughs> this is so, we got to get out of here. In the heat. Oh boy. Yeah. They, uh, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. Sounds like they turned around. Like, you know, when you get off on the side of the, like you, you made a wrong turn and then you get off the side of the road and you get out and you're like, oh, you stretch your legs for a minute. You're like, I got to get going out of here. Earth was just a wrong turn. So when the local UFO reporter came in, she asked the children to draw what they saw. And the strange thing is they were all really consistent in their drawings. They all drew the same silver disc, and they all drew what people would consider the classic gray alien. Like the bulbous head, Mm -hmm. little body. Big eyes. One child said, quote, it looked like it was glinting in the trees. It looked like a disc, like a round disc. And another one said, I saw something silver on the ground amongst the trees and a person in black. The children that went to the small school had a variety of backgrounds, but they all had one thing in common, and that was money, as the tuition for the school was substantial. Now, Cynthia Hind believed the children. And that's the ufologist. Yes. But she also realized that some of the children from more traditional Zimbabwean backgrounds some of their stories to be not alien, but something that they consider more uh, to their culture. She said that, quote, the children said that the figures could have been Zavia Kumbambo, which are spirits of humans raised by magic. Like, like not raised like familiar, but raised like raised rot, like, like from the dead. From the dead, yeah. Yeah. Or it could have been a Tokloshi or an evil goblin of the local native folklore that are said to suck the soul or blood from people. And went to Renaissance Center and grabbed a spaceship real quick. Who knows? (laughs) I guess so. They're kids. Yeah, they're kids. So obviously aliens make more sense. (laughs) Well, I wonder what the parents, like the parents probably think they're making it up or not making it up, but the parents, the teachers, you know, they're probably like, well, there's probably a rational explanation. But I wonder what they what they think, if they don't think they're just making it up, what they think they could have actually have seen. Yeah, that's well, that's part of the problem is that there's so many kids that are all reporting the exact same thing. Yeah, so if it's not aliens... Like, what could it be? Yeah, like, what would be the most... If you don't believe in aliens, if mm-hmm. you're, you know, logical, what would you say that they saw? My guess... I would guess UFO or not. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> well, it's got to be an Believable. alien. If it's, if it's not a UFO, 
then it would be maybe military. Yeah. But who's military? I guess. Cause it's overseas. Maybe it's, I don't think it'd be America. And then what's the creature they're seeing? Some kind of suit. And they just got, it's like a brand new silver Toyota Tundra. <laughs> never seen one before. Dude in a hazmat wow. suit coming out. <laughs> Toyota Tundra that flew in from the sky. It it fell. They dropped it from. There's a shipment in an airplane, and it fell. It just from, drove off after. Yeah, it was like a, it was a stunt scene where they fl- they oh. drive out of the airplane. Yep, that's pretty cool. I'd watch that. Tom Cruise, he's around ninety four. Yeah, was he? I don't know. He was. Yes. So Cynthia believed that these uh, different interpretations, accompanied by similar drawings and descriptions gave more credibility to the idea that the children had all seen a similar event, which makes sense, right? There's a lot of witnesses. They're all saying the same thing. I guess the only criticism there is that they are children. So does that make them less credible? It's the idea that there's multiple children, maybe. Yeah. I think the most credible thing to me is the fact that they all described it and drew it the same. Because even if, like, if you get, like, 15 adults together, you can kind of like someone can lead it and be like, hey, this is what they're going to ask us this. This is what we say when they ask us to do this. This is what, you know, like somebody organizes it. Like, I don't think it's hard for me to imagine perfectly these kids organizing that. Like, I could right. see kids being like, oh, let's tell, let's tell, let's the, tell a lie. Yeah, for fun. Let's see how far we can take this thing. Yeah. And maybe they did say, well, what are we going to say? I mean, maybe, maybe it was, but. I don't know. That's not fun. I'm not sure about that. But uh, the incident did attract the attention of Harvard professor John Mack. So he came later in the investigation. It was probably a couple months later where he came down finally. But this is where the investigation, his interviews became a little bit more, I'd say, suspicious. Just because it was so long. And the children never mentioned this before. But during his interviews... That's when the children started saying that they all received a telepathic message during the 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 fifteen minute visit. So they're adding to the story. Yes, they're yes ending. Yeah, I think they are yes ending to this John Max questions, and they're all to their credit, they all did give the same message. Was that the aliens telepathically told them that the environment is very precious and we need to take care of it now they're they're looking at the youth they're like it's too late to save the adults yeah they're stuck in their ways (laughs) and they well the kids like but you have a toyota tundra (laughs) though shut up (laughs) it gets 14 miles to the gallon that's plenty i i am suspicious of this i am dubious of this kind of advice from aliens because i think it's kind of a uh if it truly is what happened right I think it's kind of a uh, a red flag or a well, or a facade. It's in line with the belief system if you think that nuclear weapons attracted aliens to Earth. Like yeah. if you look at like nuclear testing in the 40s and then all of the UFO sightings that kind of took place around that time and people draw that connection. In that case, then it doesn't – if you believe that, then I don't think it's – out of the realm of possibility to think an alien would come with a message of like, hey, maybe y'all should stop doing that. Like, we're in Zimbabwe. <laughs> if, if they're benevolent, I think that's fair. I don't necessarily think aliens typically are benevolent. I think they are menacing. Maybe they're trying to reverse psychology. And then the kid's like, we're not going to, he knows. He, <laughs> see, the problem is he went a little too young. Yeah. He needed to go to like 14 year olds, 15 yeah. year olds. And then they just like, threw everything back at him. Yeah. Like, what about your environment? <laughs> How's your planet doing, huh? Why are you leaving? <laughs> but they would just, you know, not listen. They would destroy it. Yeah. Just to spite the aliens. So they have, uh, the children, most of them, have all pretty much stuck to the same story ever since. Not many of them have wavered. But now I want to look at maybe some explanations for what happened. So the first explanation we have is the theory of mass hysteria. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before in other episodes. Phoenix Lights, I believe, was one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, There's a couple other ones. But the theory is basically that one kid said, hey, what's that? 
and then they all are like saying the same thing, like, oh, it's an alien, and they kind of yes and each other into believing that they saw the alien on the hill, right? So that's the idea behind this mass hysteria, is that they all kind of take this idea and run with it. The other explanation is actually really similar. It just kind of uh, pinpoints who it is. And, quote, this theory is, what if this one guy made it up? And that was posited by Vice. By, uh, Vice. It was what? What if this one guy made it up? No, what did you say after that? It was posited by Vice. What do you mean posited? Pos- put out there. Posited by Vice? Vice, Vice the, uh, the news source. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Vice threw this out there. As yes. In, okay. Yeah, the, the news source Vice said, what okay. if there's a one guy? I was like, I, I swear I know English. Okay. <laughs> okay. I got you. I mean, uh, so, but that, is it one person made it up and the other ones believed him or one person made it up and they all agreed to buy into the lie? one person made it up or two people in this case and um, they all believed him and they grew on it. So it also is kind of that mass hysteria. So that's the main explanation for this. Probably a little conformity too. Like mm-hmm. you don't want to be the one student that is left out. Yeah. Like I don't want all my classmates to have seen an alien and I didn't. So yeah. I, I guess, you know, maybe I guess I saw something. Mm-hmm. Or like, like they're all saying they saw this disc on the hill, but you're like, that's definitely a Toyota. Tundra. Tundra. That was, but they said it was like 20 feet away. Like it's not like it was, you know, 300 yards. Right, and it, it was, was close. If it was like far away and they couldn't perfectly make it out, 20 feet. Mm-hmm. But I got some quotes from this article about what happened because what really happened because this guy, he came out and he, he said like, I made this up. His name is Dallin. So the one, one student from the class, Dallin, he stated quote, no, I didn't see a UFO. I made up the whole thing. So he's claimed that he's the one that said, that's a spaceship. Uh, he said that he and a friend came up with this idea and they never thought it was going to work, but they wanted to get out of class. Down said that he began pointing to a rock and that was, it was shining in the sun. And he said, quote, there's a spaceship. There's an alien. Now, within a half an hour, all the kids were talking about it and all the kids were running around and the whole school was buzzing, which is what he, his goal was. He wanted this. Now, it's like one step above like one of those assembly meetings where you get out of class. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. You want to get a class, I, you want to get everyone talking. I got to be it. very honest with you. Just imagining kids, yeah, hearing that story. Yeah. It's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. There are a limited number of kids. Like 62 is not a lot for the whole school. So the whole school was on break. It was yeah. like one grade. It was the whole school out there. Yeah, cuz there's no faculty teachers. meeting. Yep. There are any uh, cameras? In 94? Yeah, there were VHS cameras. I don't know. There weren't any cameras on property. But you know what's funny, though? You can see there are interviews, like people interviewing the children after this happened, which is pretty interesting. To on hear a that. camera. <sighs> <laughs> like a news camera, yeah. Yeah. It's not as simple as, as Dallin made it up because there are witnesses who are convinced. Like one witness said, quote, they had huge eyes that you cannot look towards. And once we got that eye connection, everything else around us just disappeared. That's when I started feeling the message, the idea that just came over me into my being. It wasn't talking. It was telepathic. It was just a feeling, this overwhelming feeling of how important the environment is. And she continued. She said, quote, it didn't touch me physically. But it felt like with that stare, it touched every ounce of my body. So both these girls, Emma and Selma, they both experienced this this connection with the aliens, this telepathic connection, and they both felt it. They both felt the same message. Selma said, quote, we need to clean the air, beautiful plants, clean soil to be able to live and thrive. That's the message that they got from this alien. It was Al Gore in the Toyota Tundra. <laughs> With a megaphone. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Please. I'm super serial. <laughs> I don't know why he was he was starting his thing in Zimbabwe in the 90s. And <laughs> Al Gore was, you know, who knows. But John Mack, the Harvard professor, the guy we talked about, he, quote, unequivocally believed the children after his trip to Africa and considered the aerial school sighting one of the most 
credible sightings ever. Most of the kids still believed and they were convinced of what they saw. Even though Dallin was pretty convinced that he said, I made it up. But that could also be him not wanting his name tied to this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what kind of ridicule these people might be facing, if any. Who knows? I mean, I don't know how many people know the names of the right. the kids. But maybe he just, like, I want to distance myself from this experience. I don't want to be known as the alien kid. That could be it, too. But two more witnesses, two brothers, they said that people over the years tried to discredit their experiences or convince them that, that what they saw wasn't real. Tapfu, one of the brothers, said, quote, it definitely was not a rock. I know what a rock looks like. On the lower half of it, there were lights. And his brother, Tapfu's brother, said he saw the being and it terrified him. It was short, had long arms, and it was greenish with an overall shaped head. Now, again, Dallin is convinced he is an outlier amongst his 62, and he says that his former schoolmates were duped, or maybe they truly believe what they'd seen, but I'm sorry to tell you that it never happened. They're lying to themselves, end quote. Yeah. So those are some of the explanations for what happens. Really, it's mass hysteria mixed with uh, either true belief or, or some kind of trick. It's like a social experiment. Yeah, it really is. So now we're going to move on to some other sightings in Africa of UFOs. Charlie, you know what's scarier than the movie Jaws? Uh, everything. Well, yeah, but especially surfing the web, exposed without any protection. Thankfully, we have a shark better than Jaws to help you out. That's right. We're talking about Surfshark. Surfshark offers a VPN, virtual private network, that keeps you safe while browsing online. Their VPN offers a safe and private connection between your device and the web that encrypts your personal data and online activities. So essentially, it covers up everything you do. It's basically like putting a mask on your browser. Like Jason, you know, an actual scary character. Right, so like when you're killing teens. With Surfshark, you know you have the ultimate security while you live your trendy lifestyle. Heading to that new cafe that just opened up where you say you're going to get some work done, but come on. You actually just ended up with 15 tabs open browsing who knows what. And in that moment of vulnerability, Surfshark has your back. We're talking about being completely untraceable with a seamlessly rotating IP address. And you're essentially the digital Bigfoot. And we all hate ads, right? Ah, well. With Surfshark's clean web, you never have to worry about annoying pop-ups again. Sharing is caring, too. And with Surfshark, you'll get an award-winning VPN service on unlimited devices. Because who isn't always simultaneously on their laptop and their mobile phone? At the same time. Pretty sure that's what simultaneous means. Oh. In addition, they offer Surfshark Alert. And let's be real, we aren't always monitoring our data. That's why with Surfshark Alert, they immediately alert you when any personal info is leaked. You can even use one account for the whole family. So take action today. Secure your privacy with Surfshark. Use the coupon code BIZARRE for an extra three months free at surfshark.deals forward slash bizarre today. So these stories all come from Art Angle. Art Angle? ArtAngle.uk. Cool. Just some UFO sightings out there in Africa? Yeah. Yeah, pretty, uh, well, they're all based in uh, South Africa, at okay. least, in the okay. South vicinity. The first story is from Cynthia Hind. Oh, okay. Should be familiar. Good connection there. Um, yeah, but this one takes a couple of years later. In November 1996, she said she went to Bedora, 90 kilometers from Hahara. She went there to interview a 17-year-old boy named Lloyd, and he was a student at secondary school, so like high school. And he was studying for his zero levels. I have no idea what that means. But this is what he told Cynthia. He said, quote, between 1 and one thirty on March 6th, type of birthday, Tyler, 1986. Yeah. Uh, That's four. He woke up. And because he knew it would be quiet at that hour, he decided to do some studying for his exams. One thirty in the morning. I feel that. <laughs> and while he was engaged in his studies, he heard a clicking sound. Not unlike a telephone dialing, except there was no telephones in this area. It continued for several minutes. So Lloyd decided to check out what it could be. He opened the front door and looked outside. He could hear the sound coming from up the road. When he glanced in that direction, he witnessed something very strange. 
he quickly went outside and hid behind a hedge to get a better view. And he was able to observe a small figure, about one meter high, with a head like a rugby ball, dressed all in white overalls. On the back of the creature, it had a small satchel attached to it, which was a, an aerial with a flashing red light. Lloyd was terrified. He said he asphyxiated with fear and ran back into the house and jumped into bed and covered himself up with blankets. And that he didn't really sleep. He slept fitfully for the rest of the night because of this. At six in the morning, the next morning, he went back to look where the creature had been, where he saw walking, and found several footprints, which he could not identify, which he attributed to the creature. When he arrived at school, he told his friends about seeing a ghost of the night, but one of his friends suggested that it was a UFO, and Lloyd is now under the impression that the creature had been called a UFO. <laughs> End quote. It's close. He's close. Yeah. I, there's no way he passed that test. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> no. He needed his parents to write a note. Yeah. Sorry, my son experienced something extraterrestrial. Can he please take the test Lloyd tomorrow? Lloyd saw an alien. Can he have a sick day, please? Yeah. So the next story. Now, this person wrote into Ariel, and she wrote her story out. She said, quote, She wrote into the school? No, she wrote into the uh, ma- the website, Ariel. Or art, art. Yeah, Ariel is a school. My bad. Did I say Ariel before? Yeah, you said Ariel. Art angle. So this person wrote into Art Angle, and she told her story about this extraterrestrial. And she said, quote, My name is Johanna, and I farm near Feathers Drop, 150 miles from Harhara. I am 31 years old, and on February 5th, 1996, I woke up from a bad dream just after midnight when I heard a car go past. I got up and looked out the bedroom window, which faces the front of the farm. I watched as two cars pass each other, a strange sight, as there are usually few vehicles to be seen, and none at night. One car pulled into my gate, and I immediately thought, oh no, these guys are coming to pitch my new engine on the, on the, on the borehole. <laughs> on the borehole. I don't know what a borehole is. I assume some sort of farming equipment. No, I've never, I didn't play Farmville. I rubbed my eyes and face to make sure I wasn't still asleep. And I looked at the car again, and it was long and wide and made a low humming sound. I could see lights from the back, a few red lights, and a front light, which shone high enough to illuminate the tree stops. The car, or object, stopped at my gate for a good 30 seconds, and then drove on as if the gate had been opened. And that was it. It was gone. I took my torch, my rifle, and my four farm working dogs, and we went out to the gate. Despite the fact it had just rained, there were no tire tracks or human tracks on the road. We approached the gate. I could feel heat coming from the surface of the road, a really aggressive heat radiating from the ground. Even my ears felt flushed with heat from the ground, and I was soaked with precipitation. It was now 12.30 in the morning by now, and we found nothing further, and I went back home. Was it precipitation from rain or the time of sweat? Rain. It was only the following morning that it occurred to me that we had reached the gate. It was closed. And I realized that the car had disappeared through a closed gate because I had watched it go through it and the gate hadn't moved. The next day after that, I sent one of the farm workers to fetch some sheep who were lost in the bush. On his way back, he said he saw an object straddling the road. By the time he reached the spot, it was gone. But strangely enough, the sheep would not walk over the area where the object had been. Instead, they diverted around it. My workers were convinced that this was a ghost, and because I am a Christian myself, I believe it was a phantom or a spiritual phenomenon of some sort, because I don't believe in UFOs. (laughs) Which is actually pretty common for the area, that there are, that they say that the, the people in Africa in this area see a lot of things in the sky, but they don't attribute them to UFOs, they attribute them to spiritual things. That's fair. I mean, yeah. it's, it's all culture based. Mm-hmm. Exactly. We talk about with the gin, right? We see, we see, experience something that we consider just to be a haunting, but because the culture, it it dictates what you think the the answer is to your paranormal yeah. problem. Mm-hmm. I I love that they saw an alien like you saw a UFO. <laughs> There's just something so innocent about that. He's like, that. I saw a UFO. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. 
Um, this is the last story. And he also wrote into um, our Our angle. He said, quote, my name is Kedro. And the things that fly through the night that you call UFOs, which in Africa we call Abahami Abvatoya, or the fiery visitors. Now, long before they were heard of in other parts of the world, we, the people of Africa, had contact with these things and the creatures inside them. I can only speak with certain constraints because we are not allowed to talk in detail about these sacred things, or else the starships will stop visiting us. There's a creature called the Matende Ya Nagenji, the gray or white creature with a large head, the face of chalk white with large green eyes that go around the creature's head so it can look at you over its shoulder. This creature sometimes captures human beings, cut them open, then close them up again, and makes them forget what happened. This is only discovered if the person is put into a trance, and then he remembers. I was once abducted myself by the creature. They paralyzed me, then painfully examined me by sticking instruments into my nostrils. A female creature seduced me, but it was very cold and unpleasant, a feeling of being violated. I then found myself back in my bush, and when I approached my village, all the dogs tried to attack me, and I had to be rescued. I then learned I'd been missing for three days, and there are many creatures who are watching us over curiously, and I think and they are regulating our development for some reason. End quote. So he was like, hey, it is absolutely frowned upon in our culture to talk about this. <laughs> You want to know what happened? Well, I you want, mean, you want to hear that tea? Could you imagine having something like that being like in your mind and like nowhere to put it? Like he had no one to talk about it to. That's why you journal, man. That's why you bottle things up and I you mean, blow up. He later. did, but he told people about it. Like he sent it out. There are all these cultures that have like these entities that they don't feel like they can talk about. Mm-hmm. What do we have? That we like, don't feel like we can talk yeah, about? Yeah, we're like, don't ask your coworkers what they make. That's what we have. <laughs> yeah. And it's just to keep us down. And that's that's uh, enforced by the higher-ups. The higher-ups. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't want to say it's discouraged to talk about, like, demons, but, like, it's almost taboo. To a certain degree, but I don't think it hits our, like, it's not as strongly, we're not as intense about it. Yeah. As, you know, like Navajo with like, you know, skinwalkers and mm-hmm. things like that. It's just, I don't know. Like we were trying to, we were trying to work it with Slender Man. <laughs> if you talk about him, he going to come. <laughs> but yeah, those are the end of my stories. So now we're going to uh, move that, on. That's German, isn't what? it? Der Grossman? Uh, Der Grossman. Ah, we ain't got nothing. All right. <laughs> we don't got a thing. Um, so now we're going to move on to the discussion. So this is where we like to stop the episode and thank everyone who has joined our Patreon. And just a couple today, Sue Ann and Laddie Girl. Thank you both for joining the Patreon. We've got a lot going on there. Tyler, what's one thing that these people can expect now? Listen, they've come in and they've begun to be shipped. I'm very excited. The Not Tears 2024 annual pin is getting shipped out. What that is, so like other merch, like shirts in the dedicated tier, shirt and hoodie in the not tier, that's after a few months of being involved, kind of Patreon's rules. But we have a yearly pin that is gone once the year is up. So Mm -hmm. our 2023 one is gone for the most part. Stay tuned. We might have some extras. And, you know, we've actually had some people reach out and be like, dang it, I lost it. That sucks. I'll Mm -hmm. try not to put it, you know, my new pin on. So if you're in that situation where you maybe you lost the 2023 one and you're in that tier, stay tuned. But anyone yeah. who has ever been a member in the year of 2024, so whether you are a member now or you join tomorrow or next week or whenever, you automatically get our 2024 not tier enamel pin, which is fittingly the not deer. It's an awesome, awesome design. It's a couple normal deer looking at this not deer. Like, what yeah. is this guy doing? So what's going on with him? It's It pops. It looks awesome. Shout yeah. out, Jalen. It's an awesome design. So that is yours immediately after joining the not tier. And also, I wanted to talk about something else in the not tier. Mm-hmm. I, I bring it up a lot because I think it's really cool. The hoodie. Mm. The hoodie is such a unique, cool design. It's very heavy on the pink and the teal. And it just... It looks dope. Yes. And these are not like, 
oh, by joining this tier, you get the privilege of purchasing. Like, no, you uh, just get it. You just get it. If you're a in member, if you're a member of the not tier for three months, you get the shirt and the hoodie, and you don't have to even wait three months. As soon as you join the not tier, you're automatically eligible mm-hmm. to get that year's pin, and, and yeah. every year afterwards that you're a member. Mm-hmm. And so, as you know, as long as you just send us back that uh, uh, size detail. Yes. You will absolutely get the hoodie. That is true. Check you if you are a current member and you have not gotten a shirt, check your messages because chances are we reached out, asked you which size shirt you want, and your notification didn't get in front of your eyeball. Is what it is. It happens. I, I ignore so many emails. Me too. <laughs> it's my favorite pastime. But yeah, that being said, we uh, talked about the not tier. Let's get into uh, more about this sighting. So what qualifies, like, or not qualifies, that's, how do you fund being a ufologist? It can't just be <laughs> book sales. You know what I mean? Like, I'm no, like, if you no. think about science, like my sister, she teaches too, but I feel yeah. like when you're a scientist, you need like, and you work for a school, you get funding, yep. right? Like you want to do a research, mm-hmm. they want to know your findings, so they fund you to go, to go do your project so you can hire people, get the yeah. equipment you need, yeah, yeah, yeah. go travel. If you are a ufologist and you want to travel to Zimbabwe to interview these children yeah. about a UFO sighting, is that just all on your own dime hoping that you can write about it and make profit on book sales? Well, here's the thing. I think if I knew how to do that, I would be doing it but to it, make the money. But, but it's not like it's – I'm not saying it's a wealthy career. No. But well, John Mack, he was – primarily a teacher at Harvard. That was his job. Him. I, I'm talking about Cynthia. Oh, she was from Africa. She was from there. She's from there. She is from there. She's still area. a ufologist, though. Oh, yeah. I guess, well, you know what? It's probably easier now because you just be Uber. I probably most <laughs> u- ufologists are like actually Uber drivers. Yeah, you know, definitely. Are, part-time Uber driver, part-time ufologist. And there's nothing wrong with that either. But they're, you know, they say if you get in their, their cab, their their car, and you even breathe the word UFO, you are in for an earful. <laughs> you are the whole pro- trip. It's probably rare that that the passenger is the one that brings it up. Unless they have like <laughs> one of those signs on the back of their car that or their seat that says like free water. And by yeah. the way, if you want to talk about aliens. <laughs> free water. Just say the word alien. <laughs> just, just breathe it out of your mouth. Think it. I'll, I'll say it. Um, you ever seen a glowing object up in the sky and then lose four days? I think you're right. A lot of people. Well, there's also <laughs> conferences. People attend conferences and they yeah, want to hear from speakers. That's expensive shit. Yes, it is. Like, I've seen, I like, on, on my boss's dime, I've gone to those type of conferences, trade shows, and they are not cheap. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't, I don't know. And it's, I'm not saying it's impossible. And, and I'm not saying, like, I don't know is what I'm saying. Like, I don't know how you make it as a ufologist. I know we always joked about, like, you need to write a book to become a ufologist. At least one book. But I think you have to keep writing. You have well, to keep grinding, I think, to make it. Unless it's just purely a hobby. I also think that's a big part of it, too. I think a lot of these people are primary jobs are, like, not ufologists. They, like, they need to become, like, YouTuber ufologists and, like, milk the content. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, if we could live off the podcast, we could essentially become a ufologist. Like, we, like I, I don't mean that in that we're qualified yet. I mean yeah. that we could then dedicate the time to learn yeah. how to become a ufologist. And, also and we like could travel to interview Joining people. groups and stuff, too, like MUFON Support or whatever. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they all pitch in to eat for that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's like three bars of jerky. Anyway, so let's talk about the Rua incident. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the thing we talked about. How credible do you give it? Like, do you think— How it, credible do you give it? Well, what do you think? Do you think it's, like, very credible or not very? Because think about the circumstances. Like, do you think a lot of the mass hysteria had something to do with it? Or or did most of them see something? Or there's also that, you know, being left out mentality. like The conformity aspect. Yeah, they're seeing something. FOMO. I don't want to be left out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think there's certainly a possibility that it could have been fabricated and just hyped up. And then, you know, the mind is interesting. If you start believing in something. Yeah. I mean, look at cults and things like that mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. you can if somebody with any type of power or not even power but conviction mm-hmm. like if you see someone and they're likable and they truly believe in what they believe in it's easy to follow them that's true and you don't want to be left out and it, you know what could have started as like yeah this could get us out of you know classes for the rest of the day 
snowballs into this big event, right? And I, I guess another question I want to ask you, right, is about the interviews after with John Mack, about the, the messages that didn't really come to light until months later. Yeah, it's suspicious. It's very suspicious. Also, this is the 90s. This isn't like the 40s or the 50s. So if someone's like, what did the alien look like? So they picked the most stereotypical version that they probably had already seen mm-hmm. before. I I do th- – so what I think, I think that they – something did happen. I think something did land. I don't know if it necessarily did look like that. They just kind of said that because that's what they think aliens look like. I don't think it had anything to do with the school. I think it was something else entirely. Because if it was with the school, it would have paid them more attention. You know what I mean? Like it would have focused on them. Oh, so you're saying it it could have been a sighting, but it it wasn't like the aliens were focused on the school. It's just they happened to land there. Yes. And they were just past, you know, it was just like sightseeing. That's what, I don't know about, yeah. Something. I mean, like not sightseeing. They just happened to see them. It wasn't, it wasn't intentional by the school. It's yeah, just, no, this, this is where they like landed. a million odds to one. Like th- there's like no way this could have happened. There's no way this could have happened, but it did happen. And I don't think it had anything to do with the kids. I don't think they sent them a message. I don't think it, well, that's true too. But then, but if that's a lie that they're starting to add on to, it just kind of like retroactively it, it does. makes it you a little nullifies skeptical. the whole thing. Not nullifies, but it, it makes you think maybe the whole thing's bullshit. I, that's why I really don't like the last part where they add on the message. It's like you you, you went too far. You should yeah. have stopped while you were a hen. Exactly. But that's what I think. I think I think something did happen though. I think something landed. Do you go believable? Yeah. I mean, that's the definition of believable, isn't it? If you do believe in your heart it happened, I believe it. So I don't believe Dallin. I think he doesn't want to be associated with this anymore. Yeah. I think you're right. I think he wants to be pulled away. Maybe he doesn't believe what he saw when he was a kid. It's just the fact that all of them were so convinced and they all had very similar stories. That's what gets me. Yeah, these are third graders. I don't, you know, like, well, I mean, not like, not all of them. What, what, how many grades are there in this school? They didn't go into that. I think it's between first and third. I think it's kind of more like a, um, oh God, I can't remember the name of the type of school now where it's like the kids teach the other kids the, the, I can't remember the name of the school, okay. but it's not really separated by grades. I think. I think I'm going to go skeptical. Yeah. I think that makes, I mean, that's totally fair. I understand why you're going to go skeptical. It's kids. They jumped the they they jumped too much with the the telepath telepathic thing, mm-hmm. and you got one of the students coming out and saying they fabricated it. Yeah, I think it's like I think adults' memory is already really hard to kind of believe. Yeah. <laughs> over time, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's very easy to to reconstruct memories. You hear that all the time with like car accidents and yeah. witness reports and things like that. So, I, I like for children who are excitable and have huge imaginations and want to get out of school for a couple people to just start something and saying it, it's so easy to, to buy in. Yeah. I would love to hear more interviews too. Like if there's 60 kids there, you know, like I wish there'd be 30. Cause if you got 28 of them, they're like, you know, like if 20 of them said, no, I saw mm-hmm. the lights underneath like that one kid, you know, it's also, on the other side, if it was a rock, you'd think they'd be able to go back a day later and, and be like, like find the same rock. That's the same rock. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's unbelievable. I mean, it absolutely could have been a an alien sighting. But I, I definitely go believable. They saw a UFO, and then out of the UFO came another UFO <laughs> <laughs> walking oh, around. Lloyd. But uh, let's move on. Oh shit. Um. But yeah. So we're gonna end on believable and skeptical. Thank you for listening to this episode, the Rua Incident. Unique encounters with alien kids. Don't, kids. It doesn't happen often with kids. Or if it does, you don't hear about it. They say kids are more in tune with things like ghosts. It's true. Does that, does that also parallel over to aliens? I don't know. I, I for some reason, in that. this case, I don't think it's true, apparently. I've been thinking about that. I don't know if it is. I, I think maybe not. And it's not like – I'm not saying that they're not intelligent and I'm not saying that they're not well-intentioned. It's just like – it's just kids, man. They're excitable. Yeah, they things, believe in like things, things like Santa Claus. Yeah. You know how deeply I believe in Santa Claus? Like you'd hear jingling and I just like truly believe there's a chance he's outside yeah. on my 
my well actually if kids are listening if you have if you're an adult and you're riding in a car right now Santa's real we're talking about him <laughs> like he's not real but we, we're gonna we pre- know he's real we're gonna pretend for a second like he's not real you know like I thought like yeah of course he goes to every child in the world and right now he's on my roof yeah you know so why wouldn't it be hard to buy into the idea that yeah one kid said there's an alien where where over there oh where's it at mm-hmm. and you have to look in that look at that experience like with the same they all have the same kind of conviction. Um, but also gullibility as well. Mm-hmm. And nobody, like, especially a third, fourth grader, you don't want to be the one that didn't see the alien. Right. You'd be missing out. Or, or you know what? I'm wrong and they saw aliens and that's dope. Yeah. Monastery school. That's what I was thinking about. Monastery. Mm-hmm. Which is, it's, it's a type of school. You almost, program. you applied for one, didn't you? I did apply for one. Yeah. But they're like, you're not a kid. <laughs> <laughs> this like, kid's teaching What do you kids. mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is definitely a unique... I don't know about the most credible experience ever, but it's unique. I just want to say, if you enjoy the show and you're liking the episodes, if you could leave a review on Apple and a five-star, that would be fantastic. And if you're on Spotify, we're getting closer to that 5,000. And I would just like to ask you to leave a five-star. Here's another thing. Yes. And we don't ask much, except for every episode we ask you to do exactly what Charlie just said. That's true. Tell a friend, word of mouth, conversationally. Podcasts are still hip. I mean, in five years, they might be gone. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? We might be, I don't know. Like a be. dinosaur. We, we actually have jobs, so we would be at those jobs. But um, <laughs> it's true. You know, it's like sometimes some of the best podcasts that I've listened to have been from recommendations. That's true. So, you know, if you don't want to take the time to leave a review or if you've already left a review and you're like, what else can I do? Sometimes just like bring it up. Be like, hey, do you, you know, while you're walking or driving, if you listen to podcasts, check out this one. They don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah, it's a good time. Aliens and ghosts. Come on, stop by. Yeah. Yeah. And if you've caught up on the whole back catalog, number one, damn. Number two, we've got a lot of stuff going on on Patreon, like more than what we mentioned earlier. There's, it's, a whole, it's a whole thing. I'll tell you that right now. It goes back to 2021. Yeah, we've been doing it for a while. Uh, we love the work, and we love all the things we get to do, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you for listening. So it's there if you want it. If you're caught up, you need more content, it's there for you. But we appreciate you. Thank you for listening to the podcast where neither of the hosts drive a Toyota Tundra. You drive a Toyota, though. I do. What is it, a Highlander? Highlander. Yeah. But thank you. We appreciate you. So as always, I'm Tyler. And I'm Charlie. And catch us next week on Believing the Bizarre. A podcast as bizarre as you are. <laughs>